Okay, I think we've waited enough. We can officially announce the Indian mission to be over. The Chandrayaan-3 mission, launched back in August, is now officially over. Mostly because after waiting and waiting and waiting, it looks like both the lander and the rover are no longer operational. And so, hello on for prison, this is Anton. Let's do a debrief of the Indian mission, what it was able to achieve in two weeks on the surface of the moon, what it basically discovered, and why it's not actually a surprise that the rover and the lander did not wake up. Here's actually a recent picture posted by NASA showing us exactly where all of this happened. And here's a video showing us the rover entering the surface, ready to explore the moon. And so first of all, this entire mission was technically planned to only last for 14 days, during the lunar day. And that's because all of this was ran using solar panels. And that's because using RTGs, for example, or essentially nuclear batteries, is definitely beyond India's capabilities. And that's because producing actual RTGs or nuclear batteries requires an entirely different type of technology, something that a lot of countries are just not able to do right now. Nevertheless, the rover known as Pragyang rolled onto the surface and pretty much right away started to collect science, and did so for almost 14 days. And during this time, it was able to discover a lot of sort of exciting things. For example, by using this instrument that measures seismic activity, for the first time in many, many years, this mission recorded an actual seismic event, potentially some kind of a moonquake. And because this is a moonquake in the polar region, it's particularly interesting because it's not clear what produced it. Although, just as I've discussed in the video in the description, it could be the result of thermal changes on the surface of the moon. But we're not going to know more about the source for quite some time. Then it also used a laser to conduct a spectroscopic scan. It actually had two instruments for that, the X-ray spectrometer and the laser-induced breakdown spectroscope. Now one of its main missions was to try to discover water, basically trying to discover if this region would be suitable for any kind of a crude mission. But instead it discovered sulfur. Well, actually not just sulfur, a lot of other stuff as well. Aluminium, iron, calcium, chromium, titanium, manganese, oxygen and silicon. But sulfur in this case is particularly intriguing because it's normally the result of volcanism. And on the surface of the moon, we expect a lot of it in the darker regions, the mare, former sites of volcanism, but not really in the brighter regions where this rover landed. Yet for some reason there seems to be quite a lot of sulfur, suggesting signs of previous volcanism from somewhere. And because this is in the polar region, it could actually be the result of something a little bit different. Lunar atmosphere. Although technically it's known as exosphere because it's extremely thin. Here's for example an image of sodium distribution around the moon. And something similar probably happens to sulfur as well. Basically it circulates around the moon, being deposited in certain regions in much higher quantities. This can be actually a combination of several things, but very likely the result of activity from the sun and quite a lot of electrostatic interaction that's pretty much everywhere on the moon. Pictures of lunar dust levitating above the surface were actually taken as early as some of the first Apollo missions. And so this is maybe what's happening here and how some of this material makes it to these unusual locations. Which basically means that there are probably higher concentrations of certain things in certain locations. And trying to find those higher concentrations would be very beneficial for any potential future mission, especially involving humans. But one of the main explanations for how this got here basically involves sunlight. Because here we're in a polar region where there's a lot less sunlight, the average surface temperature is much lower as well. And so quite a lot of dust freezes on the surface here, as opposed to much warmer equatorial regions from where dust probably escapes. And some papers have already suggested that because of the sulfur here, it might be much easier to build things like, for example, lunar concrete. By mixing sulfur into concrete, it becomes extremely strong within hours and doesn't require any water in the mixture at all. So we can actually build structures here much, much easier. And so discovering these elements in this location, definitely kind of exciting. But its main mission, water, was not found. And that's after basically two weeks of searching. This location seemed to be pretty dry. It might have water underneath the surface, but no ices, nothing hiding on the surface. But intriguingly, by using this unusual probe, something else very interesting was discovered about the surface of the moon, or technically confirmed. This probe was only measuring the temperature on the surface, but also right underneath the surface. And turns out that by just going inside the surface, the temperature drops from 50 degrees Celsius down to minus 10. 
That's basically just a tiny, tiny thin layer on top of the moon. And that implies that the lunar regolith and the moon itself seems to be a super strong insulator. That top layer does not conduct heat almost at all. So this very high range of temperature variation between the surface and right underneath the surface was absolutely not expected. Here's actually the graph produced by the Indian Space Agency showing us the depth in millimeters versus temperature. And so by going just a few centimeters into the moon, the temperature drops by quite a lot. And then one of the last things that was conducted on the moon was basically a tiny hop from the lander itself to see if it can actually take off again and land a little bit farther away. Here's the video showing that hop with the experiment going up by about 40 centimeters or just under 2 feet and moving approximately 40 centimeters across. This was of course just to test the engines and to see if these hops would be possible in the future. But after doing this for just under 2 weeks, the night came and the rover with the lander basically went silent. But then the sun came back again and the Indian Space Agency was really hoping it would be able to reconnect with the rover or at least the lander to possibly conduct some more experiments. But despite these hopes, this was extremely unlikely to happen. Because during nighttime, temperatures drop almost instantly to at least minus 120 Celsius, minus 184 Fahrenheit, potentially even lower in the polar regions. And no electronics on the planet can survive temperatures below 55 Celsius, mostly because of the components and various types of elements used in the production of things like, for example, capacitors. Basically, at these temperatures, a lot of components go through what's known as thermal expansion. So first of all, because a lot of the materials here are made from different stuff, they have a different thermal expansion coefficient expanding to different extent at different temperatures. And so when things here are really cold, you get different parts experiencing different types of mechanical stress. And because in cold temperatures, things also become extremely brittle, a lot of these parts snap almost right away. Not to mention that the glue and solder doesn't actually last in cold either. And so nobody expected that either the rover or the lander are going to be able to survive this. So they didn't, and this was the end of the mission. Nevertheless, the rover was able to cover approximately 100 meters on the surface, with the mission overall being quite successful, helping India as a country to achieve a new status. But they naturally have even more missions planned for the future, and they recently also launched a mission to the sun, all of which we'll be covering in some of the future videos, very likely in the next few months. And so until then, check out some of the previous videos covering Indian missions in the description below. Thank you for watching, subscribe, share this with someone who loves learning about space and sciences, come back tomorrow to learn something else, support this channel on Patreon by joining channel membership, or by buying the wonderful person t-shirt you can find in the description. Stay wonderful, I'll see you tomorrow, and as always, bye-bye.